technology as a friend and foe. So the, the Minneapolis sit into my celebrations. And remember, they were going on all around wherever there were Norwegians in the little country ch churches and cities. They're still doing that in many of those places. But the real sit into my started to happen after the Ole Bull statue was put up in Loring Park in 1896. <clears throat> it was a copy. And then 1897, they dedicated the, the uh, statue, and I'll show you that in a minute. Uh, and so then by 1905, Alfred Dahl, who was the head of the male chorus organization in the city, uh, said, let's have a real celebration at the statue every year. And so it began then really in 1905, a kind of tradition. They were doing it before, but this tradition started in 1905. You would have a young girl in a bunad put a wreath on the older bull statue. Someone would speak about Norwegian Constitution Day, any number of things. And then they would have the choirs singing. They would usually sing Yavi and other songs that were part of their uh, repertoire. And that began a day of celebrations throughout the two cities, St. Paul and Minneapolis. They would have luncheons. And then they had a huge celebration in the Minneapolis Auditorium that would be sometimes packed with 10,000 people, depended on when. And uh, then they had church services frequently in churches around the city. Mindeshirken, of course, was a built to have a celebration in it until the basement in 1926. So Alfred Dahl had started that, and he did this for many years. So there would be traditional gatherings at the Ole Bull statue you see here. And um, as I said, the choir would sing, the girl would place a wreath at the foot of the statue. And it was kind of like being the butter queen. <laughs> you would get chosen from all kinds of people to do this. And the music and speeches would be there. And then the celebrations began. Now the Young People's Society at Mindesherkin, which started really before the church, they started the church in some ways, but they would plan the sit and my celebrations after they started in 1922. And they don't keep very good records of that, but you can tell they were thinking about it in some of their minutes. So they would plan it so that the church, after these celebrations down at Loring Park and throughout the city, they would have a service maybe in the evening but they didn't wanna compete with the big one in the auditorium either. So they might do it the day or the day before or after. Now in 1939, uh, it was very exciting. Crown Prince and Princess uh, uh, visited the United States and they visited especially Minneapolis and uh, the Norwegian communities all throughout America. And it was the World's Fair in New York. And many royals from Europe came over, not just to open their exhibit at the World's Fair, but to visit the Roosevelt's because they knew stuff was gonna happen. So they wanted to make friends with the Roosevelt's. Uh, Crown Princess, uh, as you know, uh, <laughs> became very, if you've seen Atlantic Crossings, came and lived here and became uh, Macta became very friendly with the Roosevelt's and uh, that was very important to the uh, kind of the progress of the war. They made a favorable impression and there were thousands of people who came out to see them. They weren't here to publicly celebrate Sutton Demai. They were here in April when they visited several places like St. Olaf. And then they went around and they came back in June. They did not come to Mindeshirken, but Mindeshirken people were involved. Um, they visited St. Olaf, Augsburg, Luther Seminary, Luther College, Ebenezer, and Lingbomsen. Those are kind of the points on the royal trips whenever they come. These, they go to see kind of their colonies. <laughs> this is where Norwegian America still exists. Um, so it was a very happy, joyful time in 39. Then when the Nazis invaded Norway on April 9th, as you remember, this is a very famous picture too of Holken and his cabinet fleeing. And it was noted in the minutes in English in very strong script 
the Norwegian, uh, the Nazis invaded Norway, April 9th, 1940. And then a month later, it was Sutton to my. Now the people who had been planning Sutton to my celebrations throughout the Minnesota area had their plans in place, but everything changed in April. So it was a sad celebration. This is what the paper said, a sad celebration of Sutton to my. Now the Norwegians were front page news with their celebrations for many years. Uh, the papers knew that Norwegians were a very large part of their readership. So even though they had been planned, they changed in light of the invasion. They still had the Loring Park uh, celebration with Ole Gold statue and the Minneapolis auditorium was filled and people who hadn't been involved in Norwegian American things like this suddenly became interested because it was their heritage and they were on the side of the Norwegian people in their captivity. So there were huge outpourings of interest. The Norwegian choruses, the Nina Grieg choir uh, sang. Governor Stassen, the young man who was governor of Minnesota spoke. Sons of Norway spoke. Dr. Johan Arndt Osgaard, who was the head of the Norwegian Lutheran Church in America. He was a good friend of Håkon VII and had written many, many letters to him back and forth before the war. But he became kind of the person to speak on behalf of uh, Norway to the Americans. Then the Daughters of Norway and Val Bjornsson was the big speaker that day. And many Kirken people participated and one of them said, a year ago, we celebrated with the royals, and now it's sad. So uh, Minnesota then became a place from which the resistance had a forum. And Rasmussen, the pastor then, was very clear to give people from Norway who came a place to speak. He also became part of the public leadership he is, uh, appears, for instance, in the Minneapolis paper with this uh, ad for The Moon is Down. You know, Steinbeck wrote a novel about what it was like to be in Norway when it was led by the, or governed by the Nazis. And Rasmussen was named the Secretary of Norwegian Relief in Minnesota, which became American in for Norwegian relief later. And their goal was to raise $1 million by 1941. And Minichirken had prayer services for the welfare of Norwegians on the anniversary of the invasion on April 9th. And they, and they decided that they would raise, send clothes and ready-made homes to Norway. Now, they always said it was gonna happen after the war, but after the war, people heard that it was coming through Sweden into Northern Norway, especially. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. But Rasmussen was very deeply involved in that. Sutton Divine, 1941. Now remember, the United States is still not in the war, but the whole sense of threat was increasing and the Lend-Lease program. Uh, Norwegians were trying to get FDR to do something called lend lease. So they would lend their arms to the British and then get paid back for them after the war. And that was very important to the Norwegians. And in that movie, Princess Marta is very uh, involved in that. So once again, uh, September, September 1941, they had the same thing happen. Traditional wreath laying, here's the little girl uh, going to lay it. Then there's, they sang national hymns. And then they had an address by William McNally, who was an editor of Minneapolis Star and the Tribune and had to do with the Minneapolis Journal. And in this event, then people were looking back to the Norwegian history. So they had a tableau of Viking garb and Viking ship. And there was a speech by the Minnesota Senator, Joseph Ball, who was an, not isolationist. There were two uh, politicians in Minnesota who were strongly isolationist and the Norwegians uh, 
reacted strongly against them, even if they were Norwegian Americans, ships that, and Le Charles Lindbergh was Swedish, but he was very strongly anti uh, getting involved. Joseph Ball gave a speech then in the auditorium that night against isolationism. And Norwegian Relief Committee was in charge of that celebration and began to raise all kinds of money for this. Um, Joseph Ball defended Lend Lease and wanted it to go as well to Norway. And this entire program was broadcast so that Norwegians could hear it. They ran with the tapes, they flew them to the East Coast <clears throat> where they could be broadcast. And in October of that year, over a thousand protested, gathered here and protested against the isolationism of their politicians. And they sent a letter to FDR saying they were for whatever he did in trying to defend Europe, especially Norway. Once again, there were songs by Norwegian choirs. It was an exciting day, but it was focused on helping Norway. And in Sutton to my 1942, Crown Prince Olaf and Crown Prince Magda, Princess Magda visited the Twin Cities just before that. Uh, they went to uh, main munitions factories up in, uh, uh, where is the one up? Iron Hills. Iron Hills. And they went around very quietly. They didn't raise a lot of, uh, well, they, they did raise a lot of interest, but they were focused on getting the, uh, soldiers in Norway are armed. And when they came, uh, Prince Olaf spoke at the Minneapolis Auditorium to this crowd. Now he was confident of victory over Germany. And there's an interesting development too. A Swedish nurse spoke at the Minneapolis Auditorium celebration in on the 17th of May. And Carl Sandberg, represented a Swedish contingent of people who supported the resistance and they helped with getting this material through into Northern Norway. We can say a lot about Sweden, which we could uh, do, <laughs> but there were several, several, uh, uh, many people who did help. When I was leaving Norway in 1966, in the spring, I got on a train and in my compartment, there was a woman who had just come from Sweden to Norway to, to celebrate the resistance. And she talked, in fact, with the whole way to Fredrikstad uh, about what they had done and how the rest of the Swedish authorities hadn't understood what they were doing. So I have a clear and vivid memory of that. There was a concert that evening in the auditorium by Christian Thorberg. And then Jon Nygårdsvold, the prime minister was here. And he spoke at the auditorium as well. And Minnesota then invited Fredrik Hostland, who spoke to the church on May 20th. They didn't want to compete with the big celebration. And he's the one who with his sister and her husband got all the gold out of Norway. That's a thrilling story. And <laughs> I don't have time to tell it all here, but how he got this $70 million worth of gold up through Ondalsnes out to the sea and on its way to Great Britain is a thrilling story. And then they decided it should be in the United States. So then they brought it again to the United States. So he must have thrilled the audience with his story when he came here to give a speech. In, in 1943 was the 35th year of the Wreathing Choirs at Loring Park and the Holy Bull statue. Henry Thompson, a pastor over at Minnehaha Church, gave the invocation. And they had high school choirs this time. The Boy Scouts were there. And the governor, Edward T, or Thai, I suppose they called him. They call him Thai. <laughs> um, he was Norwegian American and was governor at the time. So he came to these events. He was always present among these events to celebrate and support the people. Um, he was Norwegian American. He probably spoke Norwegian uh, growing up as he did. He was born in South Dakota, but moved here. Um, very important supporter of all this. In the evening of Sutton of July 1943, they had a celebration here at the church 
uh, that was specifically for the church. They didn't go to the auditorium. They had Life T. Gurbanson of the Siemens Mission Church in Brooklyn. They had Sveta Nordberg, who was a very strong uh, supporter. He was at the University of Minnesota. He'd been at Augsburg. And he was also part of the OSS and worked in the Secret Service for America as an American Norwegian citizen. Elias Rasmussen sang a solo, undoubtedly Greek. He was very accomplished at that. Walter Hansen and Ruth Dolliger, picture here, was the organist. And Rasmussen's daughter played for him. Here's Norberg and Rasmussen, uh, who were at that celebration. In 1944, they could see that victory was coming. You could feel the you know, the optimism began. Herman Jorgensen was the president of the congregation through much of this time. He was the editor of Lutheran, the Norwegian Lutheran Church of America's Norwegian journal. And he was a very strong member here and was president and was very helpful to Rasmussen and the congregation. And he went to Norway right after the war, came back and reported how conditions were. He was a very important member. I ministered to him in, when I was nurse's aide at Ebenezer as he was dying, he and his wife. Once again, this was at Loring Park. Alfred Dahl led. He's on all these pictures. And Arna Haugland, the attache of Norwegian embassy, was the speaker. So they always brought someone in from the resistance, from the government in exile. Here's Herman Jorgensen, a uh, very important member at the time. Then in 1945, of course, the victory was absolutely amazing, as it was in Norway. And the people here had relatives who would write them letters from Norway saying how their conditions were and how things were going. So the people in this congregation had very vivid uh, pictures of what was going on. So they had shared, especially here, the trauma and the terror of the time. So when the uh, Nazis left Norway, the celebrations were incredible. And the largest crowd ever to attend the opening at the Holy Bull statue was there. And then they had even more people, the Norwegian consul, writer Solem, and Alfred Dahl once again, and William Gosselin, the Minneapolis superintendent of schools. Many people said that because the Norwegian teachers had taught their students to think critically, they were able to resist the Nazi teachings much better than if they had been in Germany where they'd been taught the, the propaganda. And they told several, Many teachers came over after the war and talked about what they had done. And one of them showed how the Norwegian students had protested. They'd been asked to go to a Nazi art exhibit and they all wore dark sunglasses. <laughs> Norwegians really know how to irritate authorities. <laughs> So that was a story that was told also. Once again, the wreath was laid at the foot of the statue. And then the celebration was at the Floyd B. Olson Memorial Labor Temple. Now Floyd B. Olson was also Norwegian American. He was the governor 1933 on. And he was also, uh, he died of cancer in 36, but he had this, this a monument to him. Now the church service that evening once again featured Rasmussen, Malma, and Solom. And as the summer went on, they began to learn how much the American uh, Relief for Norway Committee had done. Up to 3-1-45, March 1st, 1945, they had raised and spent nearly $2 million in relief to Norway. They had sent $400,000 to aid the underground, $391,000 for food, $259,000 for medical supplies. 
and it had gotten through mostly up the northern part of Sweden into Norway. So it wasn't just sitting there waiting to be taken over after the war. It was being used all the time. But it was also true that when uh, peace was declared, they had eight boxcars from Minneapolis of clothes ready to go to Norway. And that kind of relief effort kept on going out of the church and through Rasmussen and through Osgard for some time. Osgard ultimately raised, they say, $23 million for this. So it was amazing what the church congregation and all the others did. So Minnesherkin was during the war what Rasmussen called a forum for Norwegian aid and resistance. So from the very first, people came over from the government in exile. Some, even one guy came who took a pseudonym. He had escaped a Nazi prison in Norway and he rode with several other sailors to the Orkney Islands and then came over to Camp Little Norway up in Toronto. That's another story. Rasmussen supported that very strongly. Camp Little Norway was where they were hoping to train enough pilots to be part of the Royal Norwegian Air Force. But they went, before that could happen, the war ended. But that was a very important place as well. And I'll tell more about that in the book I'm accidentally writing. So we can be very proud and very glad about this story. And uh, then they moved the Oli Bulls, uh, moved the parades and the celebrations from the Oli Bulls statue to the neighborhood in the 1970s. I think that's what you've said, Cotty. Uh, Harry Clavin did that. Anyway, uh, that's the story as I have it so far. Thank you. We do have time for questions. If someone would like to ask, ask a question, so I make sure it's in the microphone. Can you repeat the question? Yeah. So Zoom people can hear. My name is Daniel Olson. I remember going to Loring Park for the Oli Bull statue. And I've been on the Norway Day Committee for many years. And I remember at Loring Park uh, at least one or two years, we had a camp there. We had musicians. We had everything there. I remember having stuff here at, at um, um, in the church right. over the years, the parades and stuff. I remember uh, finding a picture of a lady playing accordion and the children marching around here. And I remember a lot of things, so I won't go into details, but I've seen a lot of the seven lives right. over the years. Right. And I want to thank the people that for last Sunday for the wonderful plan we had. Right. And for two years, we didn't have anything, but I'm so happy we could have this year. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, here, here's one. Yeah. Oh. Question over here. Yeah. yeah, okay. Do you know if it was difficult to get the letters out of Norway that were received here? Um, I don't know how they did that, but somehow they did get them out. I do know that um, this is a very interesting story that I'm not quite 100% sure of, but Osgard wanted to get a message to Bergrav. And he, had a, he knew a woman who was going over to Sweden and would get into Norway. And he didn't write it, he made her memorize it. And he had tested her several times to make sure she had it right. And that message got to him through word of mouth. But <clears throat> that's a great story. And uh, 
it's been told by uh, Kari Bostrom in her book on Osgard, a little thesis on Osgard, but it was hard. Yes, here's here's one here. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mentioned to Grace on Sunday when we ran into one another. I remember from childhood coming to the Nisha Center, and there were gatherings during the war, and families came, including ours. We were at Central Lutheran, but Norma's visit, for example, had Brenda Eulen, who was a correspondent for the local paper. Yeah and was in Norway, assigned to be in Norway to bring back stories. And they were thrilling and emotional and people paid money and clothes. It was yeah. really quite right. something. Can you summarize that? Right, uh, if you could hear that, uh, she, Mary Jo was talking about Brenda Ulan. Uh, she was a columnist for the paper and she wrote a lot about Norwegian events and the Sutton to my celebrations and the war and she went over there right after the war and wrote back lots of interesting things she was a real character she was the daughter of yulan the lawyer who uh, was kind of in charge of norwegian cases from the 80s until the 20s yes yeah can you give us a couple of good books we can Read to get this whole history and take time with it and get even more than you know, it's just is wonderful. Well, I'm writing one from uh, 1950 to 1959 on up to Rasmussen, and we hope it will be out in the by the end of the summer, if not the middle of the summer. But a really good book on this is called Norway 1940, and that's a really interesting book. Doesn't tell everything, but that that gives you the kind of minute by minute. And then, of course, you can't do much better than Coleman's Nye and uh, and also the Atlantic Crossings, which I find are historically quite accurate. Maybe not in the relations between Martha and, and Roosevelt quite, but everything that they talk about in the news is on there. So. I can say, I mean, uh, first of all, the, in my hometown, Buda, there is a special part called Svenskeby, the Swedish town. I know for the first time I got to hear that we probably didn't get that one from Sweden, but from here. Yeah. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting. Yeah. And another thing, um, to, reconciliation takes really a long time. And there were the first generations of Norwegians after the war did not want to learn German at all, for instance. So that was one thing. And uh, a good friend of me in Norway, a young friend of me, told me an incident that must have been like 1990, believe it or not. He and his granddaddy was out um, fishing and doing some stuff, and there were a lot of Germans who were, were renting cabins uh, around that place just to go there as, as tourists and, and these uh, and, and his granddad was a very kind and nice person and helped everybody he could but then these germans who were also out there fishing they had an out, outboard motor and they must not have fastened it good because all of a sudden the motor was loose and fell down and drowned of course in the sea and uh, and my good friend Christopher said to his granddaughter, Granddaddy, we have to go and help them. No, he said, they are Germans. <laughs> I just want to add something about stamps in Norway and censoring of letters and getting letters. My family received many letters that have been censored, but the stamps in particular were interesting because they had been stamped with the German stamp, just the Norwegian stamp, and stamped them with the German symbol. Anything else? Just a quick note here that censorship still goes on because um, I was able to be a missionary to Germany with my former husband who was a pastor. And um, when we began our torture regime out of America during the W. Bush administration, I was very embarrassed about that. And I wrote my church in 
uh, southern Germany. So kind of a, and during my Christian Christian and Christmas message, I kind of apologized for um, our country's behavior and then told them that I had helped co-found the first anti-torture committee inland in America. You know, women against the military madness. But anyway, that I the church secretary told me that she got the envelope, but the contents were missing. They had, somebody, either the Germans <laughs> or the Americans, had taken my letter out and destroyed it and just delivered the envelope to that British here that you're living in. So it still happens today, censorship. Right. There's a question over there. No, I'm just going to say that I have um, letters like we're spoken of about between the relatives during those years and the very specific questions from here to there, and then the stamp that it had been opened and read to make sure it was um, legitimate by the Germans on the swastika stamp. But they, there was an interesting process where they sent a letter first and said, we've got the stuff ready to send you, quote, with coffee. What else do you want? Because they're sending the letter first to make sure that this applies. And then, then the I don't have a question, but um, I want to thank you for this uh, information. Yeah. It was really touching for me as a Norwegian to um, get to know how much support we got from in the Chicken and the American people. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you.